welcome to our series on Indian cinema. Our topic today is understanding Bollywood film production and consumption. We have Anupam Sharma with us to discuss this topic. He's a renowned Australian Indian filmmaker known for his films such as Un-Indian and The Run. He has led team of film professionals line producing, co-producing and executive producing international films and TV commercials in Australia. Anupam is currently working on his new documentary titled Bollywood Down Under. Welcome Anupam. Thank you Vikrant and uh, hello to all your viewers. Yeah, so firstly I would like to know how would you like to define Bollywood cinema? See, Bollywood cinema as you know polarizes people. Many people don't like the term Bollywood. Um, I have got no objection. But it is essentially the popular form of Indian cinema. Now the key about Indian cinema is when Indian cinema came to India um when cinema came to india weeks after lumiere brothers first exhibited their moving images in france while the west was happy that they could see moving images india was happy that they could see music so the roots of indian film lay in music there and then the other big component of cinema in india was that it was a unifying factor as you know dr kishore very well that india is a country of such diversity from caste system to disparity in income to religions to languages it is such such a sectioned country suddenly all of them in a dark theater found a homogeneous equ equally uh, kind of uh, something which made everyone equal and that something was cinema when the lights went out there was no royalty there was no poor there was no hindu muslim they were all audiences of the cinema and that lay the roots of the essence of indian cinema which is escape escapism everyone went to the dark theater in india to escape from whatever was outside the caste system the the class system the poverty the richness uh, you know the inferiority complex against the westerners because the britishers had just left and that is where it lay the root and while during the independence struggle and after independence um it was still meaningful cinema it is when uh, you know the desire for escape became stronger and stronger um the mindful indian cinema became more and more mindless indian cinema and that is where bollywood came into effect where the demand uh, for indian films or for films in india way way um, outstripped uh, the supply of indian cinema so they had to supply to this entertainment hungry population which was growing so fast and they decided to do that by being inspired because plagiarism is such a bad word <laughs> so they started getting inspired from foreign films foreign films which were not seen by indians um foreign music which was not seen by indians inspired some of the iconic indian films and film tunes and that's when bollywood came in so essentially it is escapist it is um entertaining it is engrossing and to use a very very corny cliche it is like indian food or the indian masala it has got the ingredients for everything it's got a comedy it's got drama it's got a bit of erotica it's got family values um it's got layers and layers of messages in it in short it's a complete package so anupam what has been your observation of the production aspect of cinema in india is it very different to the west absolutely uh, keep in mind when production began in india there was no film institute um it uh, propagated in the same way the guru shishya parampara uh, propagated for thousands of years and you would become an assistant or a trainee and you would learn it that way we of course had the doyans um you know the rays and 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 the uh, and the other iconic filmmakers and then you had the popular ones you know whether it was the kapoors or the k asifs and stuff and both had a level of of sensibility there um but after independence and in 60s when the demand again uh, you know uh, as i said was so much and the supply was less it just became what i uh, call very dearly as an organized chaos um a lot of people who came to bombay to become actors um uh, decided to stay and do other things without any interest in there um corruption seeped into production um so in fact i found out very later on in my career that in india it is an abuse to call someone you know it's it's insulting 
to be known as a production person because you know they they had no clue what to do whereas in the west production has always been a management exercise you know a logistical management exercise the directors still keep kept on coming and uh, unfortunately or fortunately even crap um, by sheer numbers force of numbers and the audience number even crap films would would get good box office so they kept on making uh, films so production had been a very organized chaos um i would say till late 1990s when um, you know when film school graduates started coming in and i'm talking mainstream bollywood films you know the other films would still um the art movement as we call it the 70s and 80s they still had a lot of educated people coming in but bollywood per se um you know had a had an over abundance of people who would run away from homes to become an actor in bollywood failing which they would try assistant directing directing or extra work or production and of course um the cinematography was the only thing which had to be professional um keep in mind this was an industry which was based on songs and dances but it was not un- until um late 80s or early 90s that there was a credit for a proper choreographer saroj khan became you know the co- director of choreography came into existence with uh, ek do teen you know uh, the famous song of madhuri dikshit so a lot of stuff was under representative a lot of stuff was undervalued and production per se was a chaos um we have to get this film out in the minimum amount of time because most of the producers were financiers themselves who had taken money on interest so speed was of an essence um and a lot of times um the star system was so huge dr kishore that if they saw a major star like um an amita bachchan or rajesh khanna or manoj kumar for example the fact that manoj kumar was the ultimate patriot they did not have the producers and directors did not have to work hard to construct his persona as a patriot he was always known as the india loving hero and whatever he did was right so you know you see some of his films the visual effects were hopeless you know the narrative would be bad but it was manoj kumar so it was never questioned that he is unpatriotic and similarly everyone had their traits you know whether it was amitabh bachchan the angry young man or or uh, or rajesh khanna um the the romantic hero the other interesting thing about production was that just the whole essence of bollywood cinema being escapist it was a double triple and quadruple layer of escapism and of creating myths and what i'm saying here is that yes you go and see a film you know it's all a myth the actor is playing a character um, the settings are all fictional but indian production scenario made it even a deeper layer of myths in the sense that the actor was never singing on his own unlike hollywood so in hollywood actors sing their own songs in india we had playback singers who were huge stars in their own right so the stars basically worked on their persona where their doubles <laughs> did the fight scenes for them they uh, 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 kishore kumar or mohammad rafi gave them the voice um which uh, you know so so that was the production structure and everything was dubbed so the production structure was okay that's all right we will get it dubbed if he's faltering on the argument you know all these things kind of fueled the whole production pr- structure in india which was i wouldn't call it chaotic because there was still really but it was organized chaos yeah. uh, it was like india traffic nothing seems to be working but you still end up where you want to go um uh, kind of thing so that that is how it developed uh, till late 1990s when production houses like excel came into picture um who i uh, you know personally give the credit and professionally give the credit for single handedly bringing western production structures into australia whether it's a first ad or a second ad they had call sheets they had uh, budgets um, i remember working with them and you know you were we knew each other at that time when they were shooting here they came to sydney one year you know before to see in november 99 to see how sydney would look in 2019 you know 2000 november that's how methodical that's how structured production became and now it's a norm um, mm. if you look at stuff if it's a norm because you know in, and also i think giving india the status of an industry in the 1990s meant that a lot of structured finance came in as opposed to mafia money uh structured finance meant you know people were becoming equity investors um there was a finance plan there were cost reports there was daily progress reports and then of course fox came into india sony came into india and they 
the management people started taking over the running of the film industry. So, so it, it has changed overly and now, you know, now it's a full fledged, I mean, it was always a professional industry. How they did it was a different thing, but the roots changed, the roots mm-hmm. changed. And, and now thanks to web series, you know, you talk to anyone in India, the old school is almost gone. Everyone is a new school. You know, everyone is talking first 80s, second 80s, finance reports, schedules, call sheets, which were unheard of just 20 years ago. Yeah. And I just want to give a bit of background here because when Indian cinema started, it in a way, you know, worked on a kind of a very Western style. It had a studio system and we started with having really big studios like Prabhat, Bombay Talkies, uh, there, there were Raj Kamal and other, other studios which were doing very well. But of course, as you mentioned, the disorganized way things function that led to the demise of studio system and brought in you know, all these money lenders coming into the picture. Absolutely. Yes, spot on. I mean, when the studio systems were there, look at the films we were getting. I mean, RK Studios, you know, Raj Kapoor Films, you know, um, or K. Asif or, or, you know, all those guys, you know, we were having Mughle Azams and Naya Daur and, you know, all these were studio BR films and Yesh. They were all studio films and they were working in a studio system. It is, it is when they couldn't, you know, keep up with the demand for films. Um, and keep in mind, you know, that uh, with the disparities in India of literacy level, of financial levels, of caste system, all kinds of disparities, um, people found a niche audience to service, you know, the, uh, the, the, the villages out of Bihar, UP or South India who just wanted to go and see, you know, a bit of a cleavage, a bit of wiggling hips and some fight sequences, wanted to escape uh, with some good couple of songs, um, and, and that's how it's kind of, you know, changed in the studio system. You know, they found it hard. Yeah. So, so you are talking about the kind of cinema going audience as well. So what it would be, how would you define or how would you differentiate the cinema going audience between the uh, Indian cinema going audience and the Western cinema going audience? See, it would be very foolish of me to put 1.2 billion audience into one pigeonhole. But broadly speaking, it again, the, the audience out of India goes back. Uh, and of course, um, with exceptions of, of the intellectuals, of the multiplex audiences, as they are called, of the big city audiences. By and large, consumption of India of films in India has been a, an escapist thing. Uh, people would go and watch films to escape. In the West, they would go out for a night out. Or, or you know, even because, you know, just like they would go to a pub. So the, but the escapist nature in India um, is very strong because what they saw on screen was totally different to what they saw on streets. Um, that is also one of the reasons why Indian films have started going abroad to shoot. Because for a, for a 10 cent, a villager in, in, in India would get a piece of Eiffel Tower or, or Opera House or New York. They saw their characters interacting in a global stage, uh, you know. Um, so, so it has by and large been an escapist thing. And I'll give you a classic example. I, you know, when I was young in India, mid 90s, you know, kind of early 90s, um, I would send my cook, give him tickets to go and watch a film. So I sent him uh, to watch a really nice film, which has been my favorite, which is Saranj, which was essentially an art film, you know. Um, and he went there and he came back and I said, how did you like the film? He said, why did you have to waste money on this film? You should have sent me another one. I said, what do you mean? And that's when I realized that audience in India is not stupid. They're very astute. Even the illiterate moviegoer in India, the first thing they would look would be the census certificate on which, remember, we used to have the number of reels. Yeah. Eight reels, 12 reels. He said, first of all, it was just an eight reel film. I said, you saw the number of reels? He said, yeah, I'm paying money. So I need to see how long the film is. Goes back again to escape. The film needs to escape, needs to be long. It needs to be three. Then he said there was no song and dance sequences there. And the streets and the houses was like, you know, there was no palaces. I could have watched this going outside my village on the small town. Why did you need to send me to a film for that? And that's when the penny dropped that, you know, the majority of the population in India go to escape to a world, to a character, to a stratosphere, which is where everything is right, where the Indian values they don't see outside on streets are practiced by their stars. You know, their stars believe that there is no low caste or high caste. Their stars believe that there is no equality. Their stars are so idealistic, which they don't see outside. 
you know, outside, some of them are still not allowed, were still not allowed to drink water from wells or, Muslim, you know, they were, they were ghettoized. So, so it, everything which was happening around the society was pushing them more and more into this escape. And, and uh, I agree with you. And uh, in uh, Satyajit Ray, in his book, Our Film and Their Films, uh, in this book, he actually, you know, discusses Indian cinema and Western cinema and the difference. And he says that, uh, you know, because the Indian audience, they generally, majority of them, and he's talking in 1970s about this population, who are majorly coming from the poor background, who don't have access to go out to, you know, theaters, uh, like, uh, you know, the um, uh, uh, proper theaters or opera, or even think about having a picnic with a family. So for them, cinema is the only escape where they can live, love, l- laugh, uh, watch some action, watch everything, what, which was a privilege of the rich and influentials. And for them, cinema gave them that kind of exposure. So you're very right about, you know, cinema. Absolutely. And that's that's, that's where the mainstream Bollywood filmmakers decided to do. Because if you go and, you know how we in the West generally would go and watch a film, the film would have a genre. It would be a horror film or it would be a tragedy or it would be a comedy. Indians, you know, the Indian producer said, we don't have the luxury to make one film on each genre. We'll just pack it all up together like a masala. Um, so you always had a comedic, you had, you had a comedy sequence. I mean, I remember talking to producers of old times who would say, dude, it's, it's looking all right. They're not a couple of, co- let's put in a couple of comedy sequences. And the comedy sequences, if you watch those films, they would just arise out of nowhere. And then came the item numbers and the dance numbers. Yeah, the film is brilliant, but how would we get people out of their seats to dance? Let's put in a dance number. So I still remember the famous dance number, Marare by Mamta Kulkarni which was, you know, which was choreographed by Ganesha Charya, which came in after the film. And it is so clearly visible because out of nowhere, the friends in the film said, oh, this has been a good item. Let's go into the show. Out of the blue nowhere. So they go to a show where there's a song and dance sequence and we go back to the film. That song was added, uh, added after the film was totally completed. Everything was done because the producers felt, you know, there is not enough spice in there. So. Yeah. And uh, there's another important aspect of Indian cinema is it's uh, multi-platform links and the link between the music industry and Indian cinema, it's so intertwined and it is so much with each other because a release of the film is preceded by the release of the film's music album. And that is again, a kind of a big, you know, drawing factor for the audience to watch the film or not. Absolutely, to the extent that in um, uh, 1990s, it became almost a music mafia. You know, um, and when I say music mafia, it happened because suddenly cassettes, which were 50 rupees or 45 rupees, came down to as low as 18 rupees. And those 18 rupees cassettes meant more and more people were buying in. Cassette recorders came in, tape recorders came in, which meant films like Ashiki, and that's how T-series grew. Films like Ashiki were not scenes interspersed with songs. It was a series of songs, a chitrahar interspersed with scenes. And suddenly music rights to the film were being sold, which would pay off the production for the whole film. Because they didn't care if the film ran or not, as long as they had the music rights and the cassettes were being sold, they were very happy with it. My last question to you is due to COVID-19, now cinema is going through its worst phase. But the OTT platform and streaming platforms have provided an alternate path for films. And you have earlier mentioned about this uh, briefly. Uh, So what is your take on this and how is it giving a new life to films or filmmakers? And is it, are filmmakers trying to, you know, make films specifically for these platforms? And of course, we have seen some interesting films coming for Netflix or Amazon and uh, other platforms as well. What is your take? See, see, there are two aspects to it, Vikrant. One aspect is that the Netflix and the OTT platforms are, are here to stay. Um, let's forget COVID for a second. Um, you know, they were a good revenue stream after the film has screened in theaters. Because of COVID, I call them, I call Netflix and OTTs the job keepers of, of, of COVID era. They are keeping the jobs for cinema and giving them an outlet till things become normal, which means big star films are getting high uh, kind of, you know, premiums by Netflix and Amazon to go and premiere on their platform, which is which works both ways. They get to increase their subscribers, the filmmakers who have spent all this money in Akshay Kumar, Starrer or a, 
or a Ludo, which is an Anurag Basu film, you know, or these brilliant films, which are not finding theaters because of COVID, are suddenly finding a lot of kind of audience with that. But in terms of OTT being a threat to cinema, a cinema will always remain cinema. When the talkies came, they said this will be a threat to cinema. It didn't. When VHS tape came, they thought cinema will die. When DVDs came, they thought it ain't going to happen. Theater will be the ultimate holy grail of films to the extent that we all know Netflix before COVID was looking at buying theaters in America to premiere their film. Because essentially in a theater, you go out to the audience and the audience come, you know, the audience come to, you know, you as an audience go out to watch a film, but on an OTT platform, you can pause, you can play. So the bond is always stronger. In the film. And OTT are here to stay. Um, OTT have also done something very interesting that it means they have kind of in a way reduced the nepotistic star power and the established star power and creating their own stars. I mean, you know, you watch films like, um, the you know the queen's gambit or or um, or you know panchayat or netflix series like mirzapur content is ruling and content is ruling because um, ott platforms know that they're giving all this money to this series it better be good otherwise they don't have viewership because you know so so look it is another um, feather in the cap of the entertainment industry it is another business model in the business of entertainment it is another outlet for people like you and me who want more outlets for our film. How it is placed in the jigsaw puzzle uh, before COVID, during COVID and our co after COVID will depend. Before COVID, people were selling, you know, making Netflix the exclusive streaming partner, which means they would go to theaters for eight weeks, then they would go on to an OTT platform and then they would come on free to air. During COVID, everything went directly to OTT platform. After COVID, let's see how it happens. Um, it also means um, one of the interesting things is that the binge. So episodes don't drop one by one. They drop all together, which means, you know, you get to watch three films together at a time and you binge watch. The binge watching, you know, it's while it is possible during COVID times. Let's see how it happens after COVID. Time. But at the end of the day, it is just enhancing the experience. It is um, enriching our entertainment industry, our film industry. And it is not taking anything because nothing can take anything away from the standard two hours or two and a half hours cinema narrative to be watched in a theater. Many thanks, Anupam, for joining us today and talking about the various aspects, especially I was very impressed with the way you explained the aspect of escapism and the kind of how different the consumption of Indian cinema is and the Indian audience are, are, are varied. Thanks again for joining us and we'll continue our discussion later on on various aspects of Indian cinema with you as well. Thank you, Dr. Kishore. Appreciate the opportunity and uh, congratulations on doing all these amazing webinars and Zoom sessions even during COVID, keeping people's passion for Indian cinema alive and fueling it with more debate, more robust discussion. All the best. And as they say nowadays, stay healthy. Thank you so much.